Born in the south of Dublin, he made his way across to the United States, where he lived as a hobo riding the railways. He then found his way over to Burma, where he became the first Western monk. He used this newfound position to agitate against British imperialism. This is the life of the venerable Damaloka. We're going to start this show a little bit differently. Um, we have a guest of the podcast on today to kind of help us understand the life of the Buddhist monk. He is one of my oldest friends and he's definitely a friend of the pod. And we've been through a lot together. And as of last year, he went away and spent a year inside a Buddhist monastery to live as kind of like a trainee monk. He's out of that now and he's back home in Ireland working as a lecturer. And we just thought he'd be great fun to have on the show. So welcome, Jamie. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks for having me along <laughs> <laughs> why Jeff had a head shake to the along thanks for having me along for the ride a wink, <laughs> a, wink and a nod yeah no thanks for having me along That's Jamie is also well aware of Connor and Dareth they've all grown up together as well kind of uh well you you, you guys know each other longer I was kind of a late comer to the party you're a late bloomer a late bloomer yeah I like how I didn't actually make any friends in college I just joined your friend group the only reason why you joined our friends group is because you lived on campus yeah, that's true. We did need somewhere to sleep, yeah. Yeah. Unlike Jamie, who didn't really need a dorm to sleep in because he was just very, very skilled at sleeping in very, very random places. <laughs> yeah, I think I slept on the roof of almost every building in that university. <laughs> <laughs> I joined you for one of them, maybe two, but I'm not too sure. Were you in a, you had a tent you pitched, right? It wasn't just like in a sleeping bag. Even a tent, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Not totally crazy. <laughs> Jamie, can you actually fill us in what you did in the monastery rather than what Oshin just waffled on about? <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, so I spent a year living in a Buddhist monastery in England. It was a monastery in the Thai forest tradition of Theravadan Buddhism. So the same traditional school of Buddhism as Damaloka. And I was Nanagarika, so I was a white-robed trainee monk. Um, I took on eight precepts, eight training rules, and lived, lived the life of a monastic uh, in this forest monastery on 180 acres of woodland. All the way through the pandemic, which was um, yeah, quite a blessing. What what is monastery life? What like what does that mean? Well, um, there's a lot of routine. You're generally up at about half past four in the morning, and you begin the day with meditation and some chanting together as a group, a community. And then, depending on the days, things can be different. You know, slightly different schedules, but it's a mix of communal work. So looking after the buildings, looking after the forest and tending to the, um, the various duties that keep the place running. And then space and time for your own meditation practice, which could be, um, you know, taking the time to go for a long walk. It could be, you know, spending the afternoon sitting and sitting cross-legged in, in meditation, or you could be in the library and reading or, or you know, having a cup of tea with, with some of the other people in the community. So it's a really nice mix and balance of... Um, yeah, sort of structured routine and rhythm, and then space and time for your own, for your own practice and how you want, however you wanted to use that. We had about twelve huts out in the forest, so the, the sort of the routine of life was that you would rotate between the forest and the main monastery building, which was an old Victorian mansion, about every six weeks. So six weeks in the in the house in the main community, and then six weeks on your own in, in this forest hut, where you would come in, in the, come in in the morning for 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 work or for for your duties collect your meal, uh, and then head back off out into the forest for the rest of the day. Yeah, the, the, I, I actually, I got to go over with a couple of friends at the very start, just to kind of, I guess, welcome you in or just be part of the ceremony um, where you became a trainee or whatever. But like, yeah, it's very interesting. You, your last meal of the day is at midday and then that's that's you done for the whole night, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. We, we take a vow not to eat after the zenith of the, the sun and the sky, so the point, the highest point of the, the sun, uh, just afternoon. So that so once that passes, you can't eat again until dawn the next day. But you can have dark chocolate because yeah, know. I still <laughs> understand why. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the the Buddha laid down a series of, of rules for the for, for his monastic order, and um, one of the rules is this rule around eating not eating at inappropriate times. And in ancient India, this would have been after, this would have been after midday. So the monks and nuns would have, you know, gone and collected their meals in the towns and villages, you know, on arms around, just carrying their bowl and receiving whatever offerings that they, they were given 
by the villagers. And then they, they left the towns and villages and went off and practiced for the, for the evening. And this was sort of part of the normal rhythm of Indian life, and um, that the, the monastics, the holy people would come pass through the towns in the morning and then the afternoon would be, you know, the time for the villagers to get on with their their their, their business or their, their drinking and gambling or whatever they might want to do when the, the holy people aren't around. So that was the sort of norm and the standard. And this tradition has kept that standard alive since since the time of the Buddha two and a half thousand years ago. But as you say... So you started drinking and gambling in <laughs> midday? But as you say, Yoshin, uh, the Buddha did lay down certain rules around things that were allowed to be taken in the afternoon as medicinal tonics. And that all of those things would have been quite rare in ancient India. But today, the time of processed <laughs> food just happened to be... <laughs> The ingredients that make up dark chocolate, jelly babies, uh, uh, marshmallows, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, Coca Cola. Are you allowed Coca Cola? <laughs> oh, oh, that's gas. So every evening there's just a bunch of monks engorging themselves on. But no, it wasn't like that. It was like you had a cup of tea in the evening. Yeah, it was kind of the, the the bit of dark chocolate. And from time to time, it wasn't always there because we relied totally on donations. So some, so whatever, whatever came to the monastery. You know, by people's free will, was what we ate. And so, if if no one had donated dark chocolate, then we didn't have chocolate. It was very interesting because, like, um, yeah, you're not even allowed to pick fruit off a tree, isn't it? There's you, you cause it's causing absolutely no harm or could do no harm. I don't even know what the what the. the, the I didn't learn much while I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's face it; I was just shocked by all the stuff. I met a really, I met, I was really interested in the lives of people beforehand. So there was one person there who used to be a car clamper who turned into a Buddhist monk, which I just thought was fascinating. Sorry, a, um, a what? But they a car clamper. Oh, a, a clamper. Car, I was like, what's a cart lamper? I was like, I was like, a how car do you clamper. lamp a car? <laughs> um, a car clamper. <laughs> and why would I done it to my van? He was a car okay. clamper, yeah. He clamped. He was a clamper, yeah. So he had a lot of bad karma to, um, to work through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from one of the worst jobs. One of the most hated people in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, just on that, actually, um, it was bizarre. When Oshin told me you were going to be a monk, it's not... You're not the kind of person I would have thought. In one way, you are the person who would be like, yeah, no, that makes sense. But another way, it's like you're a lot of fun and you're a bit of a messer. And, you know, you, you look like, do you know, when I think of someone who goes off to a monastery, I would not think of someone like yourself, do you know? Yeah, Jamie, you're, you're the type of guy where you get you get dressed up and you go on a night out uh, in Dublin and then you end up up a tree. That's kind of <laughs> just, <laughs> that's kind of yeah. a night out with you. <laughs> like you never know where it's going to go. So I'm like, I'm wondering what, like what led you from, because you're from, you're from Mulhuddar, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get from Mulhuddar, Mulhuddar in North Kent, North Dublin, North County Dublin, North yeah, Dublin, West Dublin, Dublin, West Dublin. Okay. I'm, I'm not from here. Um, how do you go from there? to a, like a monastery? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, if I'm the type of guy that's going to end up a tree and on a night out, it's maybe not so surprised that I ended up in a forest monastery. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fitting in a way. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I think I was as shocked as, as anybody really, but it, I, I started to meditate really when I was in the PhD um, because I was you know stressed and anxious and, uh, and depressed. As, as most people find themselves when they're, when they're trying to do that sort of um, that sort of work, and I just found it so incredibly useful. And so there was a sort of a mix of you know finding it useful and beneficial in my life, and then as I started to have really interesting and positive experiences in meditation, just a curiosity, you know, curiosity about what what's this all about, this other way of, of experiencing the world that you can you can gain access to through meditation. Uh, and so I went to visit the monasteries first in 2016, I think, that monastery. I just fell in love with the place, fell in love with the forest, you know, timbered acres of woodland. And, you know, nobody ends up in a monastery that isn't A, sound, and B, like, you know, trying to live their life differently and, and trying to explore other ways of being in the world that aren't just sort of the rat race uh, of modern society. So it, it actually attracts a lot of really cool and interesting people. There's 30 people in the monastery from age from 26 to 82. And maybe about 10 of us were around our age, you know, 28 to, to 30. That was say 10 of us were cool. So 10 of us. 10 <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, they, they were all, as she said, you know, all had interesting backstories. It all kind of gone traveling and done wild things in their lives and just kind of, you know, sort of slowly found themselves drawn to, to explore in this way of living and full of messages as well. You know, it, 
I think I laughed every single day when I was there. You know, it wasn't, it was serious and we took it seriously, you know, of course, and, and we're respectful. It is a, like it is a monastic community. But at the same time, there's a, a real lightness and a real joy. And it probably, you know, for, for most of us, particularly Irish people, the sense we might have of a monastery is coloured by our understanding of Catholicism, which is, you know, um, clouded by ideas of guilt and shame and beating ourselves up and, you know, self-flagellating. Uh, and there's none of that in Buddhism at all. You know, it's much more light and joyful naturally. And Asian cultures are much more light and joyful naturally. It's light, it's light and joyful, but at the same time, I feel like it's peppered with, it, it felt very restrictive. Like, but it, it's, I think in, okay, it's, it, the problem is we don't really, we do need to talk about our fella today. Um, so we don't really have that much time to devote to it. But like, it, Buddhism is about the shedding of your attachment to all material possessions. Would that be correct? And that includes friendship with love and all these things. So that's, that's where I kind of see the restrictiveness of it, but where you see the freedom of it. So that, that's just one thing I thought was quite interesting. No, I, Oshin, I can see why you would say that, it, 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 that and it feels and looks restrictive from the outside, but I mean, it's, it sounds really cliche to say, but you do realize that you you can find a greater happiness from not following those desires constantly and realizing you can be happy without the need to satisfy every single craving that arises. And you can find that you can find a more sustainable and balanced happiness from some, sort of bringing yourself back through your, your meditation practice constantly into the the present moment, which is, you know, generally pretty grand. As much as I think we could talk to Jamie all night about the monastery and life in there, we do have a, a person we said we wanted to discuss. So we want to get into Dami Loka and Jamie. Hopefully we won't get too many things wrong, but if we do, maybe just jump in and correct us. That's grand, I will do Jamie's winking. Just uh, <laughs> doesn't the, the winks don't really show up on the microphone, but we'll we'll be we'll be here to cover you. So Dami Luca was born originally as Lawrence Carroll. He was born in Booterstown in Dublin in 1856. He went to America for work via Liverpool in the 1870s, and that was we're not sure exactly when between the ages of 14 and 24. So yeah, some sometime in the 1870s uh, he went. He worked on ships up and down the East Coast uh, of the U.S. And then he seemed to get his way across using the U.S. train network and kind of became a hobo and kind of got his way through the whole system. Jamie, you were saying that he met up with a group of like free thinkers and this is where he started to kind of get alternate views on religion in particular. Yeah, so he, he would have been riding the rails with sort of hobos and, um, and anarchists in the, in the 19th century and, and became involved in this, this free thinkers movement, which was a sort of movement of atheist workers promoting the idea of, um, you know, workers' education and workers thinking for themselves um, in the face of sort of the top down institutions of religion at the time. Did you know there's a distinct difference between a hobo, a bum and a tramp? And could you think about what, could anyone answer what they are? Uh, they're all very spelt differently. That's that's excellent. Okay. Yes, thank you. Ten English points. degree. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, put that fucking thing to good use. A tramp rides the rails. A hobo stays put somewhere on a bum. <laughs> I feel like you're floundering a bit, so I'll help you out. Um, no, so a hobo a hobo is someone who's homeless but travels for work, whereas a bum is someone who's homeless and does not work, and a tramp is someone who's who travels but it does not want to work. So we're all tramps then, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all fairly trampy, to be honest. <laughs> but um, what I find really interesting was that, uh, so that this word seems to have come from the American Civil War with all the soldiers heading home. So there's one argument, there's two arguments of what the word actually where it came from. And one is that it relates to the term ho-boy, which is another word for like a farmhand, which is just a great nickname. Hey, ho-boy. But the one I found most interesting is that um, they just think it's an abbreviation from soldiers going homeward bound, ho-bo. So, um, that is cool though. I like that. Yeah, that was interesting. Nothing to do with Dami Loka, but no. <laughs> well, he was a hobo, right? He was traveling for work. Yeah. A radical hobo. A radical hobo traveling for work. Um, and he did actually get a job. Uh, he got ended up getting a job with the shipping company and he was going back and forth to Japan. I say back and forth, he was going forth and back and then forth again because it seems he went three times. And then he got kicked off the ship 
while he was in Japan because of his drinking and his behavior on the ship. So he was left stranded in Japan. Um, and it's worth noting that this is all according to him. So we don't have any sources. He wasn't a figure of note. You know, he would have just been a, a common lay worker at the time. So people weren't taking note of him. Um, but he eventually, around 1880s, he made his way to Rangoon, which was the capital of Burma, which is now Myanmar. And he got a job as a tally clerk in a logging firm. So he was just doing like stock take in and out uh, of for, of this firm coming in and out. When I was reading, I found that passports didn't exist until 1915, which I thought was just insane. So people could just come and go as they please. And that's why there was no record of him coming into America or traveling around. And they're not even sure of his name. There's I was reading there was three different. Yeah, Lawrence Carroll, Lawrence O'Rourke and William Colvin. And they apparently had about five different uh, aliases, yeah. names. He went by five different names. Aliases, that's the one. You could kind of just go by whatever you wanted back then, couldn't you? Well, as we learned with our dear old pal Lizzie Halliday, she eventually got caught, but she did try and recreate herself. Yeah, she changed her name a couple of times. So yeah, you just could just move somewhere else and decide you were someone new. But the murdering caught up with her, I guess. That kind of gets you in the end. Yeah. She had a tendency to (laughs) start murdering people. (laughs) But we should also give a bit of context for um, Burma, which is now referred to as Myanmar, which I actually looked online. It's really confusing a lot of countries refer to it as different names i guess but i think burma w- is associated with a name that was given it, given to it by british colonialists i think mm-hmm. but we'll we'll like we'll basically either be calling it burma or myanmar in this um and according to what i've been reading up on it's it's you can call it either and i think the general name is myanmar but yeah well the, time the, the u.s military call it uh myanmar but the u.s state department call it burma which is annoying Okay, and so while he was in Rangoon, he met some Buddhist monks and found that a lot of his beliefs had lined up and he was coming into this new line of thinking. And around 1884, he took ordination as a novice monk under the name of Damiloka. And there's a U in front of that, and that is a kind of a character which refers to like the venerable, which is a term that's attributed to all monks, Jamie, or is it just if you're an ordained monk? All ordained monks, yeah. So I have it here that he was ordained as a novice monk in 1884 and he was fully ordained sometime before 1899. What what does that entail? Like, what does it mean to be a novice monk and what does it mean to be fully ordained? Are you fully ordained or are you a novice monk? I'm neither, actually. I was sort of, I was the pre, pre-novice stage. I was what's known as an Anagarika. So the Anagarikas take eight precepts eight training precepts uh, which include sort of ethical precepts like no killing stealing lying uh, and then training precepts like no eating after midday and um, not going to see uh, music or get involved in, in entertainment um, then to become a novice you, t- you take on 10 precepts and at that point you wear the ochre robes of a monk and the the added precepts are around the handling of money so you formally renounce all money at that stage and you you officially receive your alms ball which becomes your livelihood, your source of livelihood. It, like it's, it's madness. Like you, you literally can't touch money once you become a monk. You're not allowed to. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's all sorts of procedures in the in the monastic code around what would happen if, say, somebody puts money into your bowl accidentally, um, and you have to sort of officially um, bring this to the full sangha, full community of uh, monks, and announce that this money has, you know, inadvertently found its way into your possession, and there's a whole procedure about how they. Um, dispose of it. Do they, they donate it or do they destroy it or what? They throw it away. But j- just to say, Connor, so when Dam- when Damaloka was, was fully ordained, he took on 227 rules that, that uh, really um, regulated almost every aspect of his, his life. And these rules involved um, rules around handling of money, rules around uh, clothing, you know, if he got a rip in his robes, uh, how he had to fix that and by when, uh, rules around not entering into... Um, um, Sort of towns and villages after certain times. So th- th- it's quite a quite a, a detailed and rigorous uh, set of training rules that he he took on to become a monk. And, and do they like? F- would you phase those in? Is that something like? Because you said you did eight. Would it be like each year you take on another ten rules, or like how does it? How do you ramp up to it? I'd struggle just to remember it. Two hundred seven yeah. rules. <laughs> I don't yeah, just, like, abide by them. <laughs> um, well, in the in in my case. You know, the idea is you do the, the year as the Anagarika, you take take the eight precepts, you work with that, and then you move on to the 10 precepts for another year at a minimum. And some people just do that, and or some people just continue with that and stay as a novice, and then others continue on and take the 227. 
and once you once you go a bit of a ramp up. Yeah, once you go through the ordination ceremony, you're you know you're you've you've committed to all of those rules. Now most of them are rules you're not going to break, you know, very easily. You know, but, you know the the kind of you know you can't build your meditation hut bigger than a certain size, or you know these things like things like that that aren't like you're not going to trip up. And, I seem like don't kill someone. Yeah, no murder. Yeah. Um, that's an easy one. Britain took over control of Burma after like a long and drawn out 60 year, not necessarily a war, but it was a number of policies and number. They just very slowly creeped in until they, I guess, had control. Anyway, they took control of Rangoon and it became an important port between Calcutta and Singapore for the British Empire. Um, and this was also with the arrival of the British also came the arrival of a lot of Christian missionaries, uh, which would become quite a sticking point for Danny Luca later on. And one of the reasons why he become so well known, um, I guess, in his circles. So we're, we're talking a lot about Buddhism and we're talking a lot about Burma. And I think what you need to understand is at the time, and I think probably still today, um, for a lot of the Burmese people, like Buddhism is very intertwined with how they live their lives. And there is a, there's a phrase here I got that came out of an independence movement that says, to be Burmese means to be Buddhist. So the two were very, very, very tightly uh, connected with their kind of like uh, national identity. So when the British came and the British started introducing a new religion and they started trying to kind of not showing the amount of respect for Buddhist cultures. They were essentially like rubbing the faces of the people. This was how it was interpreted, that they were rubbing the faces of the people of their culture and everything in the dirt. It annoyed a lot of people and Dami Loco was one of the ones who got very pissed off by it. I think that's a really, it's a really important point you're making there, Rashid, to, to really understand like the, what Dami Loco did by taking ordination and the, the power that that gave him in the face of the British you have to understand that context of how important religion is in, in Burma and how much it means to people. Like to be to be a Buddhist monk in Burma is incredibly highly respected even today. Um, and there's there's you know lots of um, cultural rituals about how monks are treated, how monks are respected, and it would give them automatically a huge amount of authority with the Burmese people. There was a bit of reluctance though with a Westerner, especially an Irishman, becoming a monk at the time. As we mentioned, Burma was just recently taken over by the British and a lot of them soldiers would have been Irish. So seeing as a, another Western, another Irishman going native as such, wearing the clothes, begging like monks do, and then also speaking the local languages, there was a lot of threat. It was kind of threatening in itself. Yeah. Do we know how he was received by the Burmese? Like, Jimmy, you were saying he would have had a lot of respect, but was it jarring? Yeah, again, I can't, I can't, can't say for certainty the context would be like in, in, in Burma, but I do know that in Thailand, Western monks are really, um, yeah, really respected and people feel really uh, proud that uh, Westerners would want to come and take up the robes and take up the, the training of, uh, of the Buddhist monks. So they get a lot of um, encouragement and support from the Thai people. I guess that the position of like a monk is meant to be kind of a venerable and uh, understated, like, because I just found it very interesting that he just became quite a... Uh, an outlier of this he became like a very critical of the british government i guess in a way in a, in a roundabout way he was quite respectful with it as well because he seemed to when he was talking to people he would direct them towards the local buddhists or the the local monks rather than him talking about buddhism he would be as you say Oshin, he was leading the way with the fight against kind of colonialism and the catholic church it, it was it was very smart though what, what i i stumbled upon like if he was to be critical of the British government to their face, it wouldn't have ended well for him. Like he would have been arrested straight away. So what he did was instead, he was very critical of Catholicism and its influence. He used his position of power to denounce imperialism, but in a bit of a roundabout way that slightly protected him. I, Osh, I think he was criticizing Christianity uh, rather than Catholicism. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't know which, I don't barely know the difference between the two. <laughs> Christianity <laughs> includes Catholicism and Protestantism. Christianity, of course. Is different from Buddhism. <laughs> Don't forget that. Okay, I need to. I need to write this down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, whoa, slow down there, PhD <laughs> doctor. <laughs> so in his late forties, we're in 1900 now. He started becoming a public figure. He started publishing huge numbers of radical pamphlets against Christian ministries that were opposing their religion and culture. Really. Dami Loka's main criticism of Christianity was that it was irrational, unscientific, and highlighted the violent dimensions of the Old Testament, which was obviously against his Buddhist beliefs. He was also a big critic of the British Empire, which recently took over uh, Burma. 
and he described them as bringing the Bible, the whiskey bottle and the Gatling gun, which the Bible being a program of conversion, whiskey being cultural destruction or alcoholism, and then the Gatling gun just being military conquest. I don't show up to any party without a Bible, whiskey and a Gatling gun, to be fair. Connor here, you brought the Bible, guys. Oh, brilliant. At this point, Burma was only colonized the previous generation. A lot of people would have seen Damiel Oka as an outsider because he was Irish and they would have had a, an awful lot to do with that colonizing because they were part of the British army. It's actually mentioned in James Joyce's Ulysses that there's a Buddha in the National Museum in, Ar in Ireland in Dublin. Uh, there's a Burmese Buddha there and that they reckon was taken from Burma during this war. Um, it used to sit at the front of it. So anytime anyone walked in, they would have gone by this. It was presented to the National Museum from a Clare man, Sir Charles Fitzgerald. He was a member of the British Army and on presenting it, he said, a trophy of Britain's newest colony exhibited to the people of her oldest. Ooh, that's, that's kind of very showy offy. That's like, look how many colonies we have. <laughs> we've got so many we're gonna give. Yeah, we've got we've so yeah. many we're gonna give our oldest one stuff. <laughs> from our newest one. Yeah. It does really highlight that not only Irish people were victims of the British Empire or imperialism, but also a large number of Irish people actually participated not only as foot soldiers, but as kind of high ranking military men and civil administrators and doctors and professionals. So, yeah, we, we always like to kind of put ourselves on the outside of that, don't we? That, um, yeah, what the, the Brit British bashing. Did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he did travel within uh, essentially what was a, you know, a British Empire. If you think about where his, you know, life had brought him from Ireland through the US and over to, you know, British colonies, he was working within that network that was created by the British Empire. Another reason why Dami Loka became popular in the, in the region was he was going on successful preaching tours. These ran from 1900 to about 1910, 1914. They were not really sure. He saw huge numbers of people coming and he hit the peak of his career when he appeared in the Irish Sunday Independent. No way, was it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that's when you know you made it. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I found quite interesting was that, like, by the time he was quite popular, people would travel for three days on foot, like, just to see him. Like, he was insanely mm. popular. There was someone, some woman at one of these meetings jumped on the ground and put her hair out so he could walk on it. Um, there's actually, a, a, if I can find it in the book, there's a great picture of, like, a, a, a that appeared in an American newspaper of that an image but I think it was a totally inaccurate uh, depiction and that sort of and because one of the rules that monks have uh, male monks is that they shouldn't come into contact with women and so one of his rules would have been not to to touch a woman never mind walk on their hair yeah it struck me as weird that one because it seems like quite a power thing almost sheer devotion I guess but yeah I always think this time in history is so interesting just this time where there was huge mass gatherings for public speakers. Like you think about like the 1914 lockout and, and James Larkin and his speeches and, you know, like huge, like thousands of people gathering, people traveling for days to hear people speak. I always just wonder, yeah. were they better speakers back then or have we just lost interest now? There's no Netflix and chill. <laughs> 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 It wasn't his speeches that got him in trouble straight away, though, was it, Daz? It was... No, so coming off one of these tours, we're in 1902 at this stage, and he confronts an off-duty police officer at a pagoda um, who was actually wearing shoes. So as we mentioned earlier on, there was a lot of controversy with non-natives and non-Burmese people coming in and not respecting their religion. So he had his shoes on, and that was a serious mark of disrespect. Uh the British authorities tried to charge him with confronting this police officer, but he gets away with it and it actually boosts his overall public reputation. Can I just jump in quickly and just say that it, 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 it Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong here, but like it seems that this was like a kind of like the Rosa Parks incident. It was one particularly small incident that actually had a lot of meaning behind it. So the, the lack of wearing shoes was showing their blatant disrespect for the Burmese people. And the fact that they, it was actually very important for these officers to wear shoes because it made this distinct distinction that they were not like the natives, they were of the other. So this was a, maybe it was a very simple moment, but it, it, it had a lot of force behind it. Sorry, just to interrupt. I saw that it was actually the on duty, when police officers were on duty, they 
didn't wear shoes, but this guy was off duty and a lot of them off duty didn't wear the shoes. So that was the, yeah. Oh, I ignore everything I said. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, I mean, just to say, I mean, it is something that is still today an important thing. And in the monastery, similarly, in, in any space that was considered sacred, we took off our shoes. What is that just being kind of your feet touching nature? Or what is that? What's the kind of the thought process behind that? Shoes are dirty, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's it. In, in just that you're, you've used your shoes to get to the place. And so they're probably pretty filthy okay. and easier to just take off the shoes and um, go in your, your clean bare feet. I, I also found it interesting that all monks wear Crocs, kind of. Or was that just you? Uh, it just it just just happened to be the case in the monastery there because you know you're taking your shoes on and off break a lot when you're going between different parts of the monastery. Everyone slags Crocs, but like every industry, someone in there wears Crocs. The the chefs in all the kitchens they used to work at wore Crocs. Like they get such a bad rap rep, but they're so popular and so essential all over the world. Essential. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought when you said all like all monks wear Crocs, it's like a, all dogs go to heaven kind of. <laughs> it sounds like the a parody movie based in a monastery. I'd watch all the monks wear Crocs. <laughs> Get sponsored. Hashtag ad. <laughs> yeah, sponsored by the monastery. I'm sure they'd have plenty of. You need to be sponsored by Crocs. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That'd be a much better way, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's what we were all thinking. Of. You were the only one that thought the monastery would sponsor it. <laughs> what was the fallout? of the poli- him like confronting this policeman uh, pretty much nothing other than it was boost it boosted his own public reputation and saw huge crowds be drawn to his preach uh, preaching tours okay so this is like a good pr stunt yeah yeah for him it was yeah definitely yeah but it wasn't right. a stunt <laughs> yeah i know yeah but it, it worked out well yeah um like if you look at the map of um um, Asia at the time, the French are coming in on the on, on through Vietnam. The British are coming in through India and Burma, and um, you know the Buddhists are really kind of feeling the pinch. And in, in Thailand, which is the last uncolonized um, Buddhist country in Asia at the time, and then there's independence movements in Myanmar and in, in um, Sri Lanka, which was known as Sinian at the time, that were using Buddhism in a way to, in the same way that Irish Catholics did in Ireland, to kind of stake the claim for why they're different um, to the, the the British, to the empire. Uh, and so that Buddhism became an important sort of national symbol and national identity in those resistance movements. Yeah, and that's kind of what led to him traveling around a bit as well. So his popularity was, you know, huge at the time. And he did spend a lot of time going around. So he seemed to have a base in Singapore for a couple of times. He was in and out of Singapore, Japan and Siam. Uh, which is uh, Thailand now. He attempted to go to the World Parliament of Religions, but the meeting seemingly didn't take place. But the idea of this World Parliament is an attempt to create a global dialogue of faiths. And that is still going on, actually, that World Parliament of Religions. So they do meet up every so often. And and I'm not actually sure what they discuss. Being sound seems to be the general vibe of it. So on on the rest of his tours, he went to the launch of the International Young Men's Buddhist Association at a university in Tokyo. The YMBA. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Dara was doing the the gymnastics as well. (laughs) Yeah. In a different and alternate world. That's what we'd be singing. Uh, But he was the only English speaker there and he didn't seem to speak any Japanese. So I I don't know. I don't know what he did there or how well he was able to communicate, but I think it was the action of being there was important. And he also went to a student conference there at the same university. So I think, I don't know, he like went to college, took part in the rag week, joined a few societies. He also then went through, like I was saying, he went to Singapore and to Siam, Thailand. Um, and he set up a, he set up schools. He kind of went around and set up his own missions and set up free schools, so to educate local people. And by 1904, he was organizing other Europeans to go to Rangoon to become monks as well. So this was him kind of starting to spread spread his wings out and encourage more people to join this the, the Buddhist movement. Um, he also went to Bangkok in 1903, did the usual, founded a free multiracial English language school and promoted Buddhist associations. So he got around a bit. He did his like grand tour of Asia, seemingly doing like a lot of good. Cutting a few ribbons. Cutting a few ribbons. 
<laughs> What's that one? Shaking a few babies and kissing a few hands. <laughs> there, there's there's one point that I guess we'll get to in Legacy later. There's one point we might get to later on, but um, what I found was quite interesting was that initially it was thought that the first Western Buddhist monks were these guys called Alan Bennett and Gordon Douglas, and they were ordained between 1899 and 1901. But our our guy, Dami Loka, was ordained way before that. So there's a lot of speculate. Well, there's there's uh, you could potentially put an argument forward that he would be the, considered the first Caucasian Buddhist monk. But at the same time, there were a lot of monks who were ordained at the time. And when they died, they were just cremated and there was no record of them. So we've no way of, we can't exactly say it, but there was probably a lot more at the time. So we don't really know who the first Caucasian Buddhist monk was. But in the promo, it's definitely our guy. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I guess most Buddhist monks wouldn't become seen or in the limelight. Like they would go to a monastery and disappear essentially. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All along the way, he was producing a lot, large amount of material and writing for a lot of newspapers. And he kind of started to gain momentum in atheist circles. Because you have to remember, Buddhism doesn't necessarily... Oh, can I say this? Buddhism doesn't worship a god. Buddhism is atheist. Jamie, can I say that? Yeah, there's no there's no worship of god in Buddhism. Yeah, this, is, this is the free thinkers movement that we talked, talked about earlier that he was involved with in America before he left. And he continued to correspond with while he was a Buddhist monk and, you know, they published some of his writings in America. Oh, wow. So the Free Thinkers movement was an atheism movement. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. Uh, we should probably jump into like one of the last large things that he's really known for, I guess, before he disappeared. And that was the trial in 1910. So he preached again in the town of Mo- this. I just kept saying Mole Man when I was researching <laughs> this, but it's Mole Mine or Mao Mine. It's the fourth largest city in Burma. And so he preached to a massive crowd and was very scathing of Christians. And it was during this speech where he said the Bible's whiskey and weapons uh, quote that we mentioned earlier. So, and he went on to say that they want, that the British intend to destroy Burmese tradition. Um, So yeah, he wasn't too pleased with them, I guess. Yeah. And can I just jump in and just point out, it it wasn't just Christians he was annoyed at. It was specifically like Christian missionaries. So he felt like imperialism was being brought in via these Christian missionaries. Yeah, that that makes sense. Pumping it into the schools. Yeah. After the speech, he was tried again for sedition, or rather the prevention of future seditious speech. And this was the first time that this was used against a European. It had been used in Burma before, but this was the first time it was used against an Irishman. So, and funnily enough, when it actually went to like court, the judge who presided over the case was an Irishman as well. So it's just really strange to imagine in the middle of Burma, an Irish judge presiding over a case of an Irish Burmese monk. Do you have his name? I don't do. It's Daniel Harold Ryan Toomey, and he's from Carolyn Tuchel. Can I share something about him? So this is this is what Toomey used to say to the, the juniors in the court office. What do you think of me? Look at my name. It is Toomey. Tu, to, pronounced tu, means hammer in Burmese. Me, pronounced me, means fire. My name is just a combination of hammer and fire. True to my name, I will first smash you up with a hammer and then scorch you with fire if you don't do your work properly. Oh, jeez. Talk about a power tripper. Yeah, he sounds like a lovely lad. Yeah, <laughs> look at me. Power fire, hammer fire. Did he just go to Burma because his name was that? <laughs> That's just ridiculous. So for his crimes, he was bound over to keep the peace and ordered to find two supporters to guarantee this with a bond of 1,000 rupees each. Does anyone understand what that means? Yeah. Yep. Kip. Good. Move on. <laughs> that was that was a sentence, but his the crime tri- crime he was t- tried for is something different, right? Well, yeah, he wasn't tried for sedition, but he was tried for the prevention of future seditious speech, is what what I read. Which how can they try you for something that they don't want you to do in the future? Yeah. So being bound over to keep the peace means that he is told that he's not allowed to give any seditious speeches, and if he does that, then he's automatically going to go to prison without trial. So it's like a it's like a gag order, isn't it? It's a gag order, yeah. And then the, the, he's, he's he's paid that bond, which is like just a, a you know a, a sort of a promise to the court, and he'll lose his money, mm-hmm. or he, the, the people who paid the bond will lose their money if he he um, ignores the court order. So as we said in the trial, he was bound to keep the peace, which basically means he's not allowed to give speeches. He wasn't allowed to go on his tours anymore. 
he kind of had to keep a low profile. He did appeal the sentence, but the decision was upheld. From then on, he became really hard to trace, kind of laid low and almost did what monks normally do and went, we assume, to a monastery and, you know, lived the monastic life, I guess. The next we really heard of him was in 1912 when a letter appeared in the Times of Ceylon which reported his death in a temperance hotel in Melbourne. Uh, but I love this bit, that in June that year, he showed up at the offices of the Singapore Free Press to deny that report. So he didn't just, like, he found out about it and didn't just go, like, oh, I'll put out a thing, been like, I didn't do this. He just went to a newspaper office and was like, hey, not dead, how are you? In fact, actually, the authors of the book suggest that the only explanation for this letter is that he wrote it himself. Uh, and they reckon that it was because it was a... Either, either a, a practical joke or an attempt to throw the authorities off his trail and give him some anonymity. Jeez. I don't know if it's the same paper, but there was another Singapore paper that had an, an Irishman as the editor, Edward Alexander Murphy. So Murphy with an O. <laughs> and he was from Killarney. And a lot of Kerry he, boys over that side of the world. Yeah. He was also publishing uh, uh, news stories about art that were against uh, Demi Loka. After his appearance at the Singapore Free Press, he was seen in Australia, Siam, and Cambodia. And in 1914, a missionary reported that he was running the Siam Buddhist Free Thought Association in Bangkok. No reliable record of his death had been found, but this was also around the time of the First World War. So, you know, things were going on. Uh, and there's a good chance he actually was in Siam at the time. So this would have been Thailand because this was the only country in the area that wasn't under colonial rule. So they weren't involved in World War I until 1917, I think they declared against Germany, Austria. So it would have been a good place to be to avoid the war, or to not be in the colonial power. So yeah, he disappeared in his 60s and there was very little known about him. And like, like we said earlier, he disappeared off the face of the earth for about 100 years until these three authors decided to start uh, exploring and writing a book about him. The book is called The Irish Buddhist, The Forgotten Monk Who Faced Down the British Empire, and it's written by Alicia Turner, Lawrence Cox, and Brian Bocking. The point that I really liked that explained why he was, in a sense, written out of history, the same way we talked about Grainne Well, um, he was written out by all the different people for different reasons. So as the, the movement in Burma for independence continued, they didn't really like this, this narrative of like they had, you know, a foreigner who was spearheading this movement or even was just one of the early agitators of the movement. So they, in a sense, forgot about him. Then in Ireland, you know, the our Irish people at the time were very, very, very uh, religious, very deeply, deeply devout. So he didn't meet any narratives that they would have liked that they'd remember him because he was trying to spearhead an atheism movement. And then on the side of, well, OK, at least uh, at least the atheists might remember him. He was spearheading the atheist movement around the world. No, they didn't really like him either because he was Buddhist. Though he was an atheist, he was still religious, which didn't fit their narrative as well. It was this concoction of things that allowed him to fall through the cracks of history. And then finally, there's the Buddhists themselves. They forgot about him. And that was mainly because of the Buddhist Society of Great Britain and Ireland, who they, their accounts don't mention Damiloka at all. And they, as we mentioned earlier, they say that Gordon Douglas or Alan Bennett were the first Western Buddhists. He divided opinion. So in Burma and a lot of Asia, he was obviously promoted and celebrated at the time. So the rural Burmese, they would have attended his preaches and sometimes travel days to go just to get to see him. The traditional Buddhists would have respected him and he would have, he actually got to meet the head Buddhist of Burma. And then finally, urban nationalists, they organized a lot of the tours for him and defended him in court. So he was well liked there. And as well as Singapore and China, he had a particularly large following. It was only when you got to Europe, really. So it was really kind of a West versus East thing. So West, they were hostile against him just because of kind of workings against the Catholic Church and our Christianity in general. Interesting. Did he meet the Dalai Lama? I have conflicting reports. I didn't see that at all. The one report said that he met the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama and him talked for days because the Dalai Lama was so fascinated with what like a normal life was like, you know, of his hoboing around the world. But then another source said that this is could be bullshit, so I have no idea. You know that normal life we all lead hoboing around the world? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of. I think that's it, folks. A very, very interesting life. Um, and again, I really love these ones about people who either just kind of came out of the woodwork or they nearly were lost to time. It just really makes you think about the amount of fantastic and amazing people in history who have not been remembered. 
I think what's interesting is you know he, he came out of the woodwork, but he went back into the woodwork as well, and we don't know actually what happened to him in the end. Um, and they speculate that um, you know having having faked his debt once, the papers were kind of unwilling to. <laughs> to kind of uh, be filled again, maybe. And so we don't have any sources of information really after 1913, October 1913, on, on where he went or what happened to him after Nash being in Singapore around that time. Well, that's what you get for faking your death, I guess. <laughs> and one other thing I would like to say about, about and you know, to our mind as Irish people who grew up with Catholicism, the idea of someone becoming being a militant sort of atheist and then becoming a Buddhist monk, becoming a religious spiritual seeker seems a bit crazy. But actually, you know, the, the, the approach of Buddhism is, is a practice um, rather than something you take on blind faith or belief. Uh, and, and the Buddhist teachings really encourage you to, um, yeah, to consider the, the words of the Buddha for yourself and put them into practice through your meditation practice and see does this make sense to me or not. Uh, and so it's a very questioning and inquiring sort of religion that really asks of you not to, to just have blind faith. So I think it, it makes sense that he was drawn to that as, a, as a, an atheist, as a free thinker. So that is the story of the venerable Dami Loka. Thanks once again to Jamie for joining us and giving us a huge amount of context on Buddhist teachings. And thanks once again to Jordan O'Leary for our lovely theme music, which is just about to kick off right now. See you again. Bye. <laughs>